Welcome everyone to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our Asian Pacific American communities. I'm your host, Joanne Whitlock, and today we are honored to welcome two distinguished officers from the San Diego Police Department. With invaluable experience and dedication, they work tirelessly to serve and protect the San Diego community. As Asian American law enforcement leaders, they bring unique perspectives and are committed to fostering stronger relationships between the police force and the diverse communities that they serve. We're excited to hear their insights on community outreach, cultural representation and law enforcement, and the challenges and successes of their work. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Sergeant Lem Sansonoy and Acting Lieutenant Terrence O to Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Hello. Hello. I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come join us. Can't be, I, I can't imagine it is not pretty busy as a police officer. Uh, yes, uh, I, we're honored to be here and thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course. So getting right into it, like, can you both talk about what inspired each of you to become officers with San Diego Police Department? Are you from here? You know, what's your journey to joining the force look like? Either one can take the question. Okay, I'll get started. Um, well, so I was, um, I was born in Korea, South Korea, and I immigrated here when I was three years old. And um, I never really thought about being a police officer, but I really enjoyed adrenaline. And I joined the Marines and uh, just anything I liked, just challenge myself. Um, I, uh, you know, all the movies we watch about law enforcement, FBI, and I thought, wow, I want to be an FBI agent. And of course, uh, it's nothing like the movies. Uh, <laughs> and so um, my journey was a little simple. After the Marines, uh, I was working as a security officer at San Isidro, and, uh, which is one of the busiest ports here in San Diego. And uh, I applied for actually the uh, canine uh, officer with the U.S. Customs and police as the San Diego police. Um, and strangely enough, I got job offers for both. <laughs> and uh, it was, and they told me to report to San Isidro and I got the conditional job offer and they're one week apart. And so uh, I actually played golf with uh, um, a canine supervisor at the time. And he said, Terrence, join the police department because every single day is different. You don't know what you'll get into or what you will um, see out there. Uh, and so I took advice and uh, I never looked back ever since. So you were kind of attracted to the action and the fact that it's just unpredictable every day. Absolutely. What about you, Sergeant? What about you, Sergeant Sansonoy? Uh, very similar to Terrence. Um, came here when I was three from Cambodia. Uh, we, we were pretty much settled in uh, San Diego. And my school was actually adopted by the San Diego Police Department. The community relations was, I didn't, it didn't impact me as a kid. We were just overwhelmed with settling in the country. But I guess there was the relationship because I was predominantly Hispanic community. So the officers were there pretty much every day, um, just connecting with the kids, passing out these stickers that I'm, a, I'm a totally obsessed and I'm a firm believer in them. Um, and what happened was you, you met these officers. I still don't even remember that. I just remember the uniform. I just saw the uniform and I was just over, you know, you just see that uniform. You just want to be in that uniform. And it didn't help because, you know, chips was on. And I associated <laughs> the San Diego police department with chips because we had tan uniforms at that time. And I thought, you know, one day, you know, officer Baker and officer Poncherello would ride up in the motorcycle <laughs> and hand me a sticker. And it, it, it was that, it was that attraction of wearing a uniform and, you know, it's your civic duty to, to give back. And ever since that, at a very young uh, age, uh, we would have career day and we'd have law enforcement officers that would come and speak to us. But the one thing that, that stuck by me, and I, I still use this speech to this day, he'd always stand up and he would say, hey, you know, if you look at all my stuff that I carry, what's the most powerful thing that you have uh, that I carry? And, 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 um, and, and, you know, everybody would say, oh, it's your gun, your baton, your you know, all that other, your pepper spray. And he said, no, it's, it's, it's my pen. And he basically said, every one of us has something and it's a brain and it's our head and that's how we use it. And it's the pen that translates in the communication. And it, it stuck by me uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's knowledge that we seek and it's, it's been pushed down from my parents. You know, it's just education. 
And, and to hear an officer say that, that, that they pride themselves off of education. And, and then I just geared my life, staying away out of trouble and everything like that. So I looked at the requirements at you know, fourth grade to see what it was to, uh, to become a police officer. So I steered away from all that stuff so that, you know, I can have a clean background so I can get hired. That's pretty much it. So you went from that glitz and glamour of chips to education. That that hits home really with me. I'm an ROTC instructor. Oh, you know, when my normal jobs are Air Force ROTC, and so wearing the uniform every day and inspiring, you know, college students to serve and become officers. So that definitely hits home. You know, back to you, Sergeant Sansonoy. You're talking about how, as a, as a kid, community outreach. That's kind of what brought you there. So now that you are in this position as a leader in law enforcement, you know, how do you balance community outreach with the demands of your roles in, in public safety? Well. I mean, we all have different paths. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I came on. I just wanted to survive the job as in making the phases so that I can make probation so I can provide for my family. And uh, Terrence is laughing right now because we were, we were, we were, we were cop cops. I mean, Terrence was in the gang unit. I was in the narcotics unit. We did high risk warrant services back and forth and the adrenaline was there, but I would never I never thought of myself as a community relations officer, even though I did it every day and we do it every day. Every contact we have, um, whether it's an enforcement posture or just walking in a 7-Eleven and waving at a kid and saying, hey, wait a second, you know, we got a sticker in the backseat of the car or a toy or whatever the case may be to build those bridges. So those are the positive things that we never saw, but we did it even from day one. We, we can't be robots, but I think now, I think my position is very impactful because I teach and it's not just teaching. Um, it's not just teaching uh, law enforcement or whoever. They, what I'm teaching is I'm teaching immigrants and refugees that are here in this country that probably have less than a year on. And I'm also teaching all the way up to chiefs from other departments. And aside from the teaching of uh, other chiefs, I'm also teaching law enforcement entities from the whole world. Like tomorrow, I don't even know who I have, but I have six people and I don't know what part of the country or the world they're from. And it's about community relations and what we're doing. Lieutenant, do you have anything to add to that about how you balance your committee outreach? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, uh, Joanne, wearing the uniform really does help. The community has this trust and, uh, and you have that attraction uh, and it really helps and one of the other ways is also uh, being part of an association. Uh, uh, Sergeant Sansonoy and I belong to an association called Pan Pacific Law Enforcement Association. Uh, we have currently 600 members and it's still growing. Uh, our members uh, mentor, I'm sorry, our association mentors members. We raise funds for scholarships. Uh, we help out our military veterans. Uh, we also fund other community charities. And being part of an association, you get to meet uh, many community leaders and influencers, and we collaborate with them to build bridges and, and, and also the trust. And that uh, being part of that association definitely helps us get our foot in the door. And uh, that way we can balance with our public safety and help the community uh, as well. I love that. You both just discussed you know, aspects of your job that you know, the normal population doesn't really understand, wouldn't see, you know, usually there's just stereotypical police officer, you make arrests, you do all this. So the fact that you guys are sharing this, all our listeners, I think it's huge and gives good insight on the rest of what police officers actually do. So Lieutenant O, can you share a memorable experience where, you know, you're talking about your community outreach efforts, where you help build trust between law enforcement and local residents? Yes, uh, you know, I think uh, Sergeant Sanson has more, he deals with more of the community. But what I can tell you is um, a memorable experience for me in community outreach is being visible and being out there. And like you said previously is, you know, we just make a restaurant. No, it's also uh, to educate. And uh, when we go to these functions and these uh, events that we get uh, invited to, they, um, they look towards us and ask us many questions and or what which, which helped build our trust with them is being um relevant and and being present and answering any of their questions regardless of what it's about because we could get asked questions about parking some park car in their neighborhood what do we do and it has nothing to do with the event but we take time uh to speak with them and uh and that goes a long way 
because of the fact that you take time to speak to them about something to them might be worth a lot, but to some others might be petty. But uh, everyone, uh, to us, everyone that is uh, with the communities, we, we like to answer any questions and uh, help them as much as we can. Yeah, I think that interaction goes a long way because I think it's just natural human tendency to see police officers and kind of lock up and just immediately get scared. And you're, you know you're not even guilty, but it's just a, like a natural tendency. Um, sorry, Sergeant Sanson, what about you? Since this is kind of more your community outreach. Yeah, this is more, more of my, <laughs> my, my realm. Um, I mean, because this, uh, this is what I do 24-7. Uh, and what I mean by 24-7 is being accessible. It's something that I took on myself. It's not that, how would I say it? It's, it's it, basically I'm on 24 uh, seven. Community members can call me at any time. Memorable moment. Uh, I'll, I'll say this is when the San Diego police department adopted my school and, you know, we did so many events and growing up in this country and, you know, from a Buddhist background, we didn't celebrate Christmas. So there was a lot of holidays that that we didn't understand. We, I mean, we loved Halloween, you know, because, you know, go to the neighbor's door, you can get all kinds of candy. But it was it was really hard. And, and Terrence knows this because uh, my upbringing, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, though. My dad never let me starve. And, and they always, you know, they always did it. But it was hard because you had to prioritize, hey, are we buying a kid a toy this year for Christmas or not? And, and we didn't celebrate Christmas. So uh, there was a, a federation that's still around. It's called the Chicano Federation. It's off of uh, 20th. And near Market Street, and they're still around, and they they partnered up with the San Diego Police Department, no different than what we're doing right now. And we would partner up with an association, and we had this toy drive. And multiple, multiple years, myself, my brother, and my sister, we received toys from you know these federations, which was the San Diego Police Department. And now we fast forward, and it's funny. I do a presentation, and there's a, a slide that, and I realize, hey, I'm I'm playing Santa Claus in this slide. So mm -hmm. we we're, we're going we're going full loop. To where I'm receiving a gift, and then um, here it is that 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 I'm handing a gift back, and it's to, and it's it's a bunch of pictures. Well, it's a bunch of kids in our room, and and they're from uh, Burma, and, and from uh, you know they're Karen, uh, so they don't have a country, and and they were the next uh, wave of Southeast immigrants and refugees that came through. But I think aside from that, I think in our position. With our community members that we work with, we have community uh, leaders and liaisons that will speak up or be the voice of the community. And if there's an issue, we had a, an event yesterday with a, it was a meet and greet with uh, business owners and it was Asian business owners and Asian business leaders. And it, it's one of those things where I learn as we go is that you give the community or people access. Um, we're not we're not giving them the revolving door. Like if there's an issue and it comes to me, I will find a way to fix it. And like Lieutenant Ellis said, you know, with this parking issue, whatever, we're giving, we're solving it right then and there. It doesn't have to go all the way up to a chief's office, but sometimes it has to. And you're giving people access and, and, and that's the relationship that has, you know, you can have a guy who works at a local business that feels, hey, look, I'm not important, so they're going to ignore me. No, we want to hear what you have in your issues, and we will try to fix it to improve your quality of life and improve your family so that you can have a better neighborhood or safer neighborhood, because we need to know those things. And I think I think giving the community access and a voice um, so that um, once you do that, then it, it spreads. They're going to say, hey, you know what, the San Diego Police Department will do this, this, and this, and it'll... It'll, it'll multiply, and then that's how we build the trust in the community. It's not just the big issues. It's, it can be as something as small as the parking that uh, Lieutenant O said. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's the smallest, you know, the smallest gestures that actually goes the long way. So I hear your passion about it. I hear your passion of your efforts. Like, you're really the right person to be put in this position. So, you know, so in your job as that community relations officer, you know, I want to, I'm kind of curious, you talk about some of the fulfilling and satisfying aspects of it, but what are some of the challenges that you faced in fostering positive relationships, you know, between the police department and those communities you were talking about? Oh, I'll go on this one too. Um, <laughs> is, is that they lose faith. They lose faith in us. Um, we come from a country where, you know, sometimes we say, hey, the police are corrupt, so we don't trust them. Um, from where I grew up, it's it's where, what are they going to do for us? 
if we bring them the problem? Are they even going to listen to us? And I always tell this to certain communities, and, and, and I'm actually very proud of the last couple of years because we we would do things um, that would, I, I would say, breaking barriers. Uh, you have certain communities, and I'll say it, Koreans uh, in San Diego, they don't call the police. Indian communities, they don't call the police. And there are certain demographics of Southeast Asians. They're, they're starting to, as in bringing forward issues. We as, and I'll say it, uh, immigrants and refugees, we, we, I wouldn't say, I don't like to use the term put our heads down, but we, we, we kind of like, we brace ourselves and we move forward. We don't um, want to make waves. We don't want to make waves. If, if, there's, if there's an obstacle course, let, let's say there's two obstacle courses and, you know, there's a couple of hurdles, a couple of barbed wires or whatever. We're just going to, we're going to go through it. We're not going to complain. And I always tell this to community members. I said, you know, our, our path is one person's path might have less barriers than us and ours will have more. But there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you got to move these barriers. There's nothing wrong with asking. And, and, and for example, I went to an event and there was probably almost 8,000 Indian from, South, from Southern California. And I gave them my business card. And I said, hey, look, when you have these events, I can provide free security, you know, connection, whatever the case. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they took my card. Nine board members. I didn't get one call. They felt that they didn't need us. Well, during COVID, the rise of Asian hate and all the other stuff, it started to worry a lot of people. It's out there. But at the same time, it's like, who's their point of contact if something was really seriously happening? And the House of India just opened up same time as House of Korea opened up. And we started establishing relationships. And their window was broken. I told them, hey, if you have any problems, call me and I'll make sure it gets done. So in the middle of the night, they called me and I sent somebody down there to take the report. That's all it took for the Indian community to trust me. Now I have connections all the way to Texas, all the way to Northern California. So when there was a trend where we have these certain Eastern Europeans that were targeting Indian businesses and that we're breaking well, what they would do is it was a, a sleight of hand uh, deception slash uh, distraction where they would go in and take these safes. Um, it, we had two cases in San Diego. I shared this with some of the leaders. It went all the way to Northern California, all the way to Texas, where they were sharing it. And then I also received video of cases that were similar that I was able to forward to the FBI. And then all it took was me answering my phone and sending an officer to investigate a broken window that was probably done by a transient. Um, little things we got to capitalize off of. So, yeah, that's why the um, you know just networking and human connection is so important. It's that one-on-one -on -one interaction. I said that goes a long way. So, thanks for sharing that, um, Lieutenant. Oh, kind of shifting over to you, kind of change in a little bit of topic. Oh, I want to hear about you were talking about your journey from the Marine Corps and into law enforcement. You know, are there some key lessons from your time in the Marine Corps? You know, fellow service member here so that shaped your approach to training police recruits is there anything from your time with the service and the marines that kind of you brought to where you currently are now with the police department yes and uh i was just going to say is uh you being in the rotc can kind of relate to it is uh several key lessons is definitely teamwork it, it, you have to work as a team and we try to stress it as much as we can another one is discipline you must have discipline uh, and also patience. You have to have patience. Um, you know, we have uh, we have recruits that come in from all over. They're diverse. Their backgrounds are diverse. Some of them were military. Uh, some of them were um, baristas, or some of them worked at uh, a stocking at uh, at a grocery store, and they become police officers. And with those three things, is teamwork, discipline, patience, is they can accomplish uh, anything. They, uh, they put their mind to. Um, we must work as a team to accomplish our goal, which is to, uh, to guide the recruits so they can graduate the academy and be successful out there. Um, a lot of them fail and, and they put their heads down and we try to let them know it's okay to fail, but let's not try to do that again in the academy. And of course, the discipline part comes into play for sure, because we want to build that foundation and also that baseline for them to be successful in the next uh, training phase, which is the field training phase. And uh, we do add a little bit of stress, as uh, I think in ROTC, you guys do that too, right? 
uh, you guys do add a little bit of stress. And the only sure. reason, yeah, yeah, and the only reason why we add stress is because out there, it, when they're police officers, individual police officers, it gets stressful. And we need to know that under stress, they can remain calm and think through it and make proper and, and uh, professional decisions. Um, and patience is the big one also, is we have to be patient with them because of their diverse background. Some may be slower, some may be faster on learning certain things about the police department. Uh, but the ultimate goal we try to stress is also is, uh, is for them to graduate the academy and go home every night and be safe. That's awesome. I love hearing that because I'm kind of just reliving some of my own time and you know, current training with ROTC. So shifting back to you again, Lieutenant O, so shifting from now your background as Marines, I kind of want to talk about your background as a Korean American. We were talking earlier before this recording, you know, as a bilingual officer and a Korean American, you're very involved in that. How has your background helped you connect with the community? And what advice would you give to other officers from these diverse backgrounds? I'm sure there's a lot of officers, especially in the Southern California area, who come from diverse backgrounds, you know, what advice would you give to them and how has your personal background helped you connect? Uh, Joanne, that is an excellent question. And being a bilingual officer, it definitely assisted in bridging the gap, uh, but also uh, really helped in building trust uh, with the unique skill that we have. Uh, The community tends to trust you more when you're familiar with their culture, their language. Uh, Like Sergeant Sanson always says, there are a lot of... um, uh, Koreans and other races that do not want to call the police and it's because they are either embarrassed or they try to just kind of handle it on their own and thinking that oh if I call the police then it's embarrassing and we try not to uh, we try to stress with them is it's okay to call the police for and I use my skill as being bilingual and Korean American uh, to because knowing their culture is to let them know it's okay to call the police. We are actually here to help them. Um, and uh, I would advise any officer with any background uh, that this is a rewarding career. Uh, you can use this skill to assist and work with the diverse communities. Uh, you could also showcase how diverse San Diego is, San Diego Police Department is, and, and all the opportunities that it has to offer. Um, I would say definitely join and you can help people you can help your own community because you're familiar with their cultures and their language and also with that skill you could also educate some officers that may not be uh, up to par on your culture or the language Um, because some officers say hey why did they do this or that it's like what's part of their culture and explain to them and clarify to them and they can better understand it and respect it as well I think that's great because seeing you all and your representation, you know, that's going to inspire others to potentially follow in those footsteps. Um, Sergeant Sansonoy, kind of back to you and piggybacking off of what Lieutenant O was saying, you know, are there any specific outreach programs in the department that you know of that has had like a significant impact on improving communications between the police and San Diego's population? Uh, Are there any actual specific programs? that we do or is it or is it that we can improve on that you could improve on i don't know if there was anything that you specifically um is it a community outreach program that you all have or that you implement or any efforts i think for us we have where i work it's the multicultural community relations office at one point or another it was called the indo chinese storefront and we, we we're still ahead of our times this is an office that is the only one in the nation. Um, when I came here to this country, I came in 1980. My wife came in 1985. This office was created in 1987. So if you could imagine the big influx of Southeast Asians, especially from Laotians and Cambodians were between, I would say 85. I was one of the first ones that arrived pretty early. And for a department to recognize the needs and to act on that it, it is very, is very impressive. The only thing that I, I can say that, that and we are doing it right now, is is how we are hiring, like Lieutenant O said, is we, it was very impressive. We had a an, uh, an event at House of Korea, and I was proud to invite 12 Korean officers, and there were some that couldn't make it. And it, it blew the community away to where, like, oh, we have 12 Korean officers? I'm like, yeah, we do. Um, 
I think we can always improve on our hiring. And, and, and like I said, we would love to hire from the community. And you don't necessarily have to come from San Diego. We, we do have a lot of transplants. Um, but my storefront, uh, unfortunately, you know, with the way things are, I'll be honest with you, we need this. We need to improve on the pay of my civilian positions. Um, it's caught up to us. Uh, cost of living in San Diego is ridiculous. I mean, even officers can't afford to live here. Um, it is, uh, it's something that we can't control, um, but we, we can make it work. Um, but the other thing is is that I know with the new direction of our new chief, um, uh, the way he restructured our uh, our department, and it's happening now. Like I said, we have Lieutenant Ambito. Well, no, Captain Ambito now. Um, he is actually in charge of the community outreach uh, from the community and for juvenile. So we have a whole department that's focused on that. And and Chief Wall said it best. He basically said, um, you know, as officers, we want our leaders to, I wouldn't say clash, but to to basically fight for us in, in city council. But the way the chief said it best, and I, I really, it really sticks with me, and I really respect it, is politicians are going to do what they're going to do to get votes. He said, you know what, if we work hard, if we earn the trust of the community and we prove our worth, and, and I, I'm 100% behind it, he goes, we don't, I wouldn't say we, we don't need the politicians, but I'm just saying that if we need something, the community will go down to City Hall and they'll say, hey, we're not taking away that program. We need this, 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 and this. And it's on the politicians to take away that program or fund that program. And I, I think we're we're moving in the right direction. And I, I respect uh, the chief and his decision on, on let's focus on the community. These are the people that really need it and, and let the community speak for us and when it goes to when certain um, units or budgets are being cut or if we need something, the community, let the community speak. And, and I think that you know, maybe they'll, you know, hopefully they'll listen to the community. But, but I think we're moving in the right direction, um, just adding more to what we're doing right now. Are there any, you know, just kind of follow up on that, are there any strategies you think are going to be key in continuing to build that? You kind of talked about your vision. Sounds like the police department has a great vision for the future. You know, how do you see the role of community relations evolving? We, we had, uh, Lieutenant O and I took the lieutenant's test and we, we had a study and there was a thing called a PERFS report. I, I don't know the exact ac acronym. It's when all the chiefs get together and they look at, and one of the big topics was recruitment and retention. And then they basically, there were three prongs that would help retain and recruit officers. And the first one is uh, basically, are you being supported by your organization? And I, and I feel we are. We, we've always been supported by our organization. And the second one is, are you being supported by your po political leaders? And then um, are you being supported by your community? And, and, and I think if we, we work on all that, we can improve the number of our officers. And aside from improving the number of our officers, um, it's a healthy workplace. Let's just say that. And we're not going to lose people. And with that being said, we have to, I say we just have to be better at, at what we're doing. We're good, but we can always be better and with the community side. And, and we have the buy-in from, from our top chief uh, that he, this is what he wants to focus on. Uh, I can compare our relationship with our community to other parts. We met, we have friends and uh, that are belong to different parts of the country, law enforcement entities, and the relationship's not that great. Uh, but at the same time, ours is great, but we can always improve. I think your police department definitely believes in the statement of, you know, the governments don't, you know, government should exist for the people, not the other way around, yes. essentially. So I love that that is your vision. That's your mindset. Lieutenant, oh, question back to you. You know, given obviously your extensive experience, it looks like you have done you know, various divisions within um, the police department, what has been the most rewarding and the most challenging aspect of your career so far up to this point? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that's a tough question as well because I loved every unit I've worked for. Uh, but what I could tell you is probably being a recruit training officer is where you are, uh, you're a mentor to the recruits and you can really make an impact to their career early on in the academy. Uh, and, and you also uh, provide 
uh, mentorship and challenge them. And you can see them actually grow in the six month academy that we offer. And uh, the challenges is, uh, that I face when I was a recruit tra training officer is um, trying to uh, make a person that's really not made for this job, try to uh, build them to be uh, an officer. But sometimes uh, this job's not for everyone, unfortunately. And um, you always kind of think is, did I let them down? Did I not do enough? Did we not do enough? Did we not provide enough? Uh, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it's ultimately they have to perform, they take the test, they have to do everything. You can only guide them in the right direction. Um, but I would say being a recruit training officer in the academy is by far one of the funnest, exciting, uh, hardest job. Uh, also, because, uh, you know, the recruits only get younger and I only get older. So uh, trying to, you know, run just as fast as them or do as many push-ups as much as them, it's a little bit uh, challenging. But I would say recruit training officer is probably one of the uh, best positions that I've, I have held and, uh, and also challenging. Great. Well, thank you to thank you both so much for these answers. Um, final question for both of you. So Sergeant Sanson, are you first? You know, if you could create any community event and bring people together with the police department and there were no budget restrictions, you know, no constraints, obviously budget is always going to be the thing that limits anything we want to do. You know, what would it be and why? I think um, we've done it before. Uh, Lieutenant, what do we call it? Behind the badge? It's like uh, a, beyond the badge, beyond the badge. Is it beyond the badge? Um, we, we do it, but where where basically it's a mini police academy for the public. Um, and, and it's, I, I think when we can do something like this, uh, where basically a, a lay person, a citizen can come and we explain what we do. And then we put them in scenarios, uh, you know, the, the shoot, don't shoot scenarios, the, the use of force matrix and stuff like that. But the reason is, is that number one, budget restraints and the size. But if you can imagine multiple stations of something like this, uh, not just, you know, use of force, but having them see everything that we do, whether uh, all the units are there and, and, and explaining what we do and, you know, with all the cool toys that we have. But then there's 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 options of seeing that. I, I think doing that and running almost a civilian academy two days. Um, where it's uh, they go to each booth, they don't have to go to every single one, and, and just seeing what we do, and maybe it's a recruiting thing, and then them understanding what we have to go through, and then, but for every age, for every age, we, we specifically, let's say you have an eight-year-old um, that sees what we do, and then you, well, when we do a canine demo of why we have to deploy the dog, or we, we use a certain type of weapons or whatever, all the way up to a person that's in their 80s, I think, to where we can cater it to, to, to do those kind of demonstrations. So I don't think we need to win the public over, but I think understanding, um, I think, uh, on both sides, on both sides. And, and then whatever their input or their question is to us, maybe we need to take into consideration their, why they're asking us this so we can explain better. So I think it's an improvement on both sides. I like that. I know a lot of people who would participate in that if you ever have it. So let us know if it ever actually goes through. <laughs> we do, but they're at smaller <laughs> scales. You know what? When we do do the next one, uh, you guys will definitely uh, be invited. And I, I think it's one of the things that the chiefs would like to do. And, and, that, and that's to get uh, community leaders and, and folks that have access, like especially like you, to, to see what we see so that you can share what your experience is. Looking forward to it. Um, okay. Lieutenant O, how are you? So if you weren't in law enforcement, what career do you think you would have pursued? You can't say the Marines, you can't say the military, you already did that. So what career do you think you would have pursued and why? I think Lem will know this is uh, I would probably be a golfer. <laughs> I love <laughs> golf. So if the no budget, no anything was in play, then uh, I would be a golfer. But no, really, that's a tough question because I do really enjoy what I do. And I used to tell the recruits this in the academy is uh, if I won the lottery, uh, I would still do what I do because I love it so much and the difference that you can make and the impact you make. But I would just have a bigger house and a nicer car. 
<laughs> so, but yes, I, I would probably say if I was to do anything else, I'd probably try to be a pro golfer. That's awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. I am really, truly inspired listening to your endeavors. You know, I, as an active duty military officer currently in the Air Force, and then Prior to that, I was a forensic investigator, so I worked with oh, homicide quite a bit, wow. you know, before I commissioned, you know, so I definitely, in both worlds, definitely felt the need for representation. Way too often, I was the, I was and am still the only one who looks wow. like me in any given room, be it gender or race. So this conversation has definitely been very inspiring and motivating for me. But as for our listeners, though, interested in supporting San Diego Police Department's community outreach efforts or learning more about becoming a police officer, is there a website or information that they can visit for more that either of you can provide? Yes. Um, we basically, we have two uh, uh, Instagram accounts. Uh, one is join SDPD and the other one is our San Diego official one. So if there's any events or anything like that, that pops up that we're going to be hosting, um, they'll post that. Uh, I, you know, I mean, the days of Facebook versus Instagram now, I think uh, more people are using Instagram because they want that information quicker. Uh, but we do also have a Facebook page, um, and, and the the SDPD recruits uh, are very, very uh, on top of things. So if you send them a message and stuff like that, you're going to get a quick response. Um, and that's pretty much what I believe is uh, the best way to get updated with our department. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Again, thank you again, Gemma and Sergeant Santanoy, Lieutenant O. Thank you for being on the show, sharing some great words with the audience. Um, to our incredible listeners, you know, we would also love to hear from you or any suggestions for future guests or topics. Don't forget to subscribe to our program on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or X, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers Asian Pacific American communities with a voice through media arts. And if you'd like to support our program, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. Till next week, have a great day, everybody.